Hello and welcome back to the official Scottish Rugby Podcast together with the Royal Bank of Scotland. On the show this week, we are joined by superstar chef Tom Kitchen, plus Scottish Rugby's very own nutritionist, Tom Coughlin. Well, joining me as always on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast is Al Kellogg and Chris Patterson, but delighted to be joined this week also by Tom Kitchen and Tom Coughlin. Toms, thank you very much for joining us here <laughs> on the podcast. I'll start with you, um, Tom, uh, from Scottish Rugby, Tom Coughlin. How are you getting on with the, uh, with the whole working from home, being a nutritionist? Yeah, it's, it's certainly quite a bit different than, than we're used to, especially coming off the back of the Six Nations, where it's such an intense period of time that you're, you're traveling with the national team and you're just doing all sorts. You're on your feet all day um, trying to get all this practical stuff done, meeting with chefs, meeting with the players. Uh, and then, yeah, coming into this scenario where you're sort of stuck at home and trying to do a lot of stuff online, um, you're trying to develop that other side of nutrition. So keeping in, in touch with all the players regularly and trying to do as much as possible from sitting in your front living room, which is, is sometimes quite a bit difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of adapting, and I'm sure for yourself, uh, Tom Kitchen, I said on the podcast here as well. Thanks for joining us, Tom. Um, no, thanks for having me, guys. I, I guess it must be a bit an odd situation for you, uh, you know, being in hospitality, you're usually working all the time, long hours, but mm. things have changed for you, I guess. So just talk us through, what, how's it been for you? Yeah, no, of course, my, uh, my whole world's been turned upside down, like uh, so many different people. Um, but, you know, certainly being home for this length of period with, with the family has been a new experience, you know. Um, and I think if I'm really honest, it's, it's highs and lows. There doesn't really seem to be anything in the middle, you know, like, uh, you know, one minute you're super high, then you're just like, ah. You, and, you were uh, saying earlier on, Tom, you've got, you've got four boys at home now. So it's, yeah, it's a four busy boys. house. Is, is, yeah, my wife deserves an absolute medal. And, uh, you know, the, so they're playing one minute and then next minute they're just like knocking bells out of each other, you know. So, and we're back to homeschooling today. So, oh, yeah, yeah. It's hard. And your boys uh, are a couple of your boys are good friends with Duncan Hodges, uh, boy, and, and, and yeah, Mike Boyer's young Hodges. boy Rory as well. Yeah, exactly. They go to school together and um, they do all their sports together. So, um, yeah, it's nice to have a connection. And, of course, I've, I've known Hodgie for a few years now. He's a great guy. I really enjoy his time. But there's so many of the rugby guys that, you know, they love food and they come to the restaurants. And, uh, you know, so I've met quite a few over the years. It's, it's fun. And, and Tom Coughlin, from our point of view, Scottish Rugby, Tom Kitchen mentioned there about the boys. Eating is hugely important and diet is hugely important. What's kind of some of the, the stuff that you've been looking out for, especially this season? And what, what kind of stuff have the boys been taking and eating? Well, it, it does actually change quite a lot. Food culture, especially within the national team and the national team boys, is, is absolutely huge. It can really help to, to develop positive habits when you get a few guys that are really into their food. And oftentimes when, when I'm designing the menus and things for the national team, I, I do get together a bit of a, a player's nutrition group or a player's food group just to see what kind of things they're into at the time. And we try and build that into the menus as much as possible. So it does, it does um, remain quite flexible and uh, we try and just yeah, get, what, get the idea of what the players really like um, and try and build that into the, into the menus and the kind of foods that we're doing. It's, um, yeah, it, 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 in my opinion, it's the best. Tom, does it still, yeah. um, as far as test week's concerned, does it still start off at the beginning of the week really nice, very, really varied, and then just as the week goes on to the point where you get to the, the pre-match meal and pretty much it's fuel that's that's what i remember by the time you got to to like three hours before the game it's you know boiled chicken and vegetables <laughs> um thankfully it's not as restrictive as that anymore uh, we try and keep <laughs> in in my opinion you know food isn't just fuel you really need to enjoy it even if you're going up to that time just before a match where it does have to be a little bit more restrictive but it still can be really good for you and really tasty so yeah, we, there is a little bit more flexibility towards the start of the week, but it does restrict itself a little bit. But thankfully, not as much as you might remember. But the guys, the car carbohydrates must have been a big part before matches, no? Yeah, it really does change depending on the kind of player that you're talking to and also the, okay. the kind of day. So when you're getting closer to a match, you do start to focus on getting more carbohydrates in your diet because that is your main source of energy. It's so important for any sport, but rugby especially as it's so high intensity. So yeah, it's really important. Yeah, my my diet was always uh, 
it was something I didn't really need to worry about. I know it sounds terrible now. I was I was lucky enough to uh, basically to eat for fuel, uh, mm -hmm. so I, I wouldn't carry extra weight. I never have. Uh, my problem was keeping weight on, really. So I was allowed to eat as much of anything really as possible, and that that did get a little bit more uh, sort of funneled, is the right word, towards the end of my career, where uh, you know. Eating the right, the correct balance of different food groups was important, but I was fairly unique in the sense that it was whatever you can get your hands on, you need to fuel your body. My metabolism is pretty quick. Um, from my memory, Al, similar, it was mainly carbs. It was carbs the whole time, more than anything else. But well, it's about a decade did, did, since did we rugby played go football. like football? I always remember in football, like when Arsene Wenger came to Arsenal and then just clamped down on like well, the, the drinking culture and all that kind of stuff. I think because. Rugby was a professional game, you know, fairly well, turned professional fairly recently. Recently, there was a lot of the stuff in the pro game that that was the starting point. So you just started with this uh, right back from I suppose when we started, Al, when I started under 15s, you would be given diet plans and training sessions and uh, and meal plans, and it was just became the norm. So you didn't really have to transition from maybe what was kind of the norm 30 years ago to to what was was deemed as professional um what, what it was always I, there rather than a big step i think one change one change i saw and we've talked about it in other areas is it 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 became and is now very much about the individual whereas when i first started it mm. was a kind of yeah. there's a group of forwards these are the big boys mm. you eat this there's the backs mm. you eat this right or you need to lose weight you eat this you need to gain weight you do that <laughs> but then it became about the individual and making sure that the individual was then being able to transfer uh, all of the good they're doing in a diet onto the park. So, uh, Tom, I, I assume that's feel that's where you yeah you, you, yeah you definitely. Um, so certainly from from uh, Chris's anecdote there of getting a meal plan at age fifteen, we're we're certainly not that restrictive anymore. And so, what we try and do within our age grade system is try and give them the tools and the knowledge to be able to take ownership of their own diet. So, really trying to promote good habits from a young age. So, that working with our Foz Rock Academy, we're doing cooking lessons with them. We're giving them workshops and all kinds of stuff going on there to really try and support that overall performance lifestyle. And I can imagine that, um, so the other Tom, Tom Kitchen, you, you do some of that stuff with Spartans as well, do you? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's just trying to get the life skills of cooking out there. Um, the, the Spartans thing is very, very basic. You know, it's like how important breakfast is and, you know, it's the simplistic thing of making porridge and putting a bit of fruit and yogurt on it. But I don't think anyone was prepared for what we're going through just now. But I tell you what, those ones who have been on these courses, I bet they're so happy. And, uh, you know, they're falling back on those techniques now that they've learned. Yeah, Exactly. It's just about keeping stuff simple at the end of the day as well. Just really simple, like the importance of breakfast. It's amazing how many people I see that don't have breakfast as a professional yeah. athlete. And if you can build those habits at a young age, it really helps them long term. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One thing our players are really into, uh, Tom, is, and I know because you, you were posting some pictures over the weekend, is cooking outside uh, on oh, yeah. various different uh, uh, barbecues or slow cookers or whatever, whatever they've yeah. got out there. But you're a big advocate of that yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think I can really, I can see the two together, the big macho rugby <laughs> player with the fire and the steak and everything, you know. I can see, I can see it. And I know a couple of the boys, they are really embracing it. But, it's a very fulfilling thing, isn't it? Like bringing the fire together, lighting the fire, your piece of meat or whatever. But a lot, what a lot of people are doing now is like they're slow cooking and smoking the meat on these like special like barbecues, like green eggs and the different weathers and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of fun that can be had. And uh, yeah, I can see the rugby boys enjoying that. Yeah, but I love it as well. And, and do you think on that point, it used to be the eating of the meal that would bring families together and, you know, that, that kind of, I suppose, that whole collective ethos. Is it now the actual cooking of the meal more than the, the eating of it that, that brings people together, especially in times like this? Yeah. And of course, when you cook outside, you, cr you create this incredible atmosphere, don't you? Mm. You know, like this warmth and the kids are happy and, you know, you have a wee glass of wine and, you know, you're, you're doing your stuff. And it's just like everything's positive. Everything's positive, and it's a really beautiful way of eating. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Until you burn everything, Al, in the barbecue, yeah. you let me. <laughs> so I've got a gas barbecue. I've got the smaller charcoal one as well, which I, I normally is taken out 
for the camping. But actually, just on because I knew Tom was coming on, was having a bit of a look into what I'm going to be doing this weekend. Because I completely agree with you, Chris, as well. That it, the process of the cooking is such mm. a joy now as well. Uh, like yeah. the ability to get the kids in, and you know, I mean, I, I say make a mess. I'll say making a mess is great fun. My wife would completely disagree because she's. <laughs> nine times out of ten the one that's following me around the kitchen trying to stop it looking <laughs> like there's been Armageddon through it in the past year we've seen maybe a, a change maybe an ethos and thinking around meat and and and, and fueling athletes so a lot of people have been t- you know taking the meat out of their diets and moving towards kind of uh, vegetarian or vegan diets is that something that Tom from our side and the nutrition side you've had to adapt for the players and Tom Kitchen for you and your restaurants have you seen more of a desire for, for people to, to move away from meat yeah, certainly from um, so from my perspective, that there's quite a lot of information out there, especially on the likes of social media and and Netflix plays a uh, an unfortunate part in that, and so there is quite a lot of misinformation out there, which has led to quite a lot of people reducing meat in their diet. And that, that's not to say that it's a bad thing reducing meat in your diet. One of the things we try and promote is just getting variety. But meat yeah. can be a really great healthy part of your diet, especially with the likes of the produce that we've got access to up in Scotland. Meat is actually a really great healthy thing for not just athletes, but also the general population. So yeah, we, we try and educate our guys across the age groups um, and between men's and female uh, pathways that meat is actually quite good to include in your diet, especially for rugby players. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, the, without a doubt, there's more vegetarians, more vegans. Um, but as far as People, people still want to eat meat, but they want to eat quality meat. More and more, it's about where the produce is sourced from, and um, but the ver- you know variety is so so important. You know, you can't eat meat five days, seven days a week. You need to spite. You need to have some vegetarian food. You need to you need to have fish. Fish is so so important. I think you know it's uh, especially with the kids as well. You know, getting oily fish and you know so important for their development and their, and their mind and everything. So. I'm a big fan of variety, yeah, but also like bread as well, you know, like eating good quality bread instead of like, you know, your sun-blessed white bread, like just really like getting your, your grains and your cereals into your diet is so, so important. And are you, on, are you cooking or making your own sourdough at home? Have you got the, the starter in the fridge? Or? Uh, no, we've got that. So uh, it's gone away with one of the chefs actually at the, from the restaurant. So he's, he's looking after it, but. Yeah, look, we're like any other family. We're, we're, we're baking. I've never had this time with the kids. Everyone thinks, like, my kids should be these amazing chefs, but they're not because we're always so busy. Yeah. Um, so it's been actually really rewarding to see the kids embracing the cooking. And if, if, if anything that comes out of this, at least we're going to have a generation of children that know how to cook later on. I've, um, I've had a birthday in lockdown, and the kids uh-huh. are on about Netflix, Tom. The, uh, the kids have been watching this uh, Sugar Rush program which right. is an American I think it's an American bake-off type thing and it's all about puddings and cakes and <laughs> showstoppers so my uh, I was fortunate enough to have a birthday in lockdown just uh, after two or three episodes of Sugar Rush so it was a pretty impressive <laughs> birthday cake I got for, oh, really? for nice. the last few years I, I, I was, uh, took a bit of eating put it that way. <laughs> we've got a um, we've got a pizza restaurant Tom and and, and guy just outside of uh, Glasgow and one thing we've started doing is do it yourself which I know other pizza restaurants are doing as well we, we, yeah. we supply uh, the dough which our, our chefs make and they are flying out the door and they're flying yeah. out the door predominantly yeah it's really people, good yeah people are looking for things to do so they go home yeah. and they cook these pizzas as a family it takes away the I suppose the, the grunt work of making the dough uh, yeah. but they still get the joy of, of, of preparing it themselves yeah, no, I think it's a great call. I, I know a couple of the pizza places are doing that in Edinburgh, and I think it's a great initiative. And it's it's amazing how these businesses are starting to think outside the box and readapt and reinvent themselves. It's like our wine supplier, you know, like you're doing home delivery of you know these incredible wines instead of people buying them in the supermarket, supporting the wee guy. You know, it's, it's good. It's good. Yeah, Tom, I'll manage to get a shameless plug in there for his own restaurants. It's only fair to talk about, <laughs> about yours. Um, just to, and for people who don't know, just talk us through um, the restaurants you've got in Scotland and, and the Michelin stars you've got as well. Oh, yeah, just no. the Michelin stars. Just throw it in <laughs> just, like that, Jamie. Yeah, yeah no. Sorry, well, that wasn't a slight on Al. That was, it'll come, Al. It'll come. <laughs> no, but we, we, have a, we have a group of restaurants now which has grown over the last 13 years. 13 years ago, we opened the restaurant, my wife and I, mm-hmm. and it was very humble. We were like, just come back from London. Michaela had been in Dubai. I'd been in France. We were in London for a bit. 
we came back, we opened the kitchen in uh, 2006, and it was literally like all my savings, all Michaela's savings, all my granddad's savings, and that wasn't a lot of savings, and like a 65 grand overdraft from the bank, and we started a wee restaurant in Leith, and we had five staff, 20 bottles of wine on the list, and the, the, the company's just grown naturally and organically over the 13 years, which is really nice, you know, it's a really nice story. And, you know, obviously we've gone on to have four children and just really made Edinburgh our home. Um, and then last year we opened the Bonnie Badger in Gullen, which is, um, which was a massive project for us. And, uh, you know, we're just juggling the world between kids and life and business and everything. So for something like this to happen, is just like, oh my goodness, it's crazy, you know? So when you did start out, in 2006 what was the goal because you've achieved so much including michelin mm. stars and growth and yeah. you know the, the the respect you have in the in the community what what was that the goal for the michelin no, star was it just no, to, not at all to we were so young we were so we were so young we were so innocent we were so raw mm. we just had this passion and drive you know and i think we're going to go on to it a little bit later is about what how do you attain that passion and drive doesn't matter if you're a sportsman or a chef it's about, you know, that dedication day in, day out. So we didn't know anything else because both myself and my wife, Michaela, had worked with such great mentors. It was drummed into us. This is how you work. Um, yeah. But then, of course, you, you grow, you develop, and you start to understand, you know, oh, wow, you know, like we've got a prestigious restaurant, you know, we're growing. And, and then you, you start to mature into the role, you know, which is... Uh, which is a big thing, you know, maturity in business is a big thing that you, you grow into. I guess it's the same in sport. Mm -hmm. You talk about the, the comparisons there. Um, I suppose as a chef, everything mm -hmm. that you create is, is being judged and, and you yeah. get to a certain level of sport as well. It, it's not dissimilar in that you've been, yeah. you've been watched by the people who are there as well as the people at home. Social media is a, an added interest that's come in throughout, yeah. well, throughout your career as well. It came yeah, in yeah. throughout uh, Chris and I's playing career. Um, is that something you enjoy? Do you, do, do, do you thrive on the part of, you know, creating something and putting it out there almost at times to, to be judged? Yeah, of course. I'm either, you know, it's something that you have to understand. Uh, before social media, it was the restaurant critics. It was the, the guides. Mm -hmm. You never, you know, the restaurant critics, they could make or break you before social media. Mm -hmm. Now social media as well, you know, people will say one thing to your face in the restaurant and then they'll go and post something uh, two minutes later. It's like, what? Come on, just speak your mind, you know, like, you know, um, but you, you were there to be judged. We were there and um, it's all part and parcel of what we do. We try our best day in, day out. Uh, we don't always get it right, but we give it our best shot. We give it our best shot. How, how do you deal with that personally yourself, but also with some of your, your mentoring as you're bringing the young chefs through? Because you look at it from our players' point of view. Now, some of our players... Um, will be quite good at, at shelving it and taking on the, the, the criticism that's, that's necessary for them to get better. And mm. others will be at home searching for their name on, on Twitter or Instagram to see what's mm. been said almost behind their backs. Um, mm. What do you do as far as mentoring your young guys through? Do you, do you encourage them to look for it or to, to try and stay away from it? No, but it's very hard to hide it from them, you know, because, you know, you, you we're one of the big restaurants, you know, it, we have a lot of followers on our Instagram accounts or Twitter or whatever. And you have to take the rough with this mood. I mean, if you, you, if I want to put myself in a bad mood and that, you know, I, I don't really want to do that, but you have that temptation to go and look at TripAdvisor and then I'm like, you know, like, the whole, but you have to, you have to be really honest with yourself mm -hmm. and you know, the truth, you know, like if you really, you, of course you're going to get feedback. You know, some people don't, if I cook a dish and I think it's fantastic, and I eat it, and then I'm getting this like little feedback from customers from the maitre d, and then I've got to take that on board. I've got to think about it. But you've also got to have that self belief and desire to, to believe in yourself as well. It's so similar, Al, and, and it's a great point you raise. And and I agree that the important thing for for me, and the important thing I'd say to young players or, or young chefs or whatever, is it just understand and be totally honest with your own mm. performance. You, you can look at other uh, other people's opinions, but if you truly 
evaluate and are totally and utterly honest with your own performance, you'll know what you've done right or wrong. As long yeah. as you've been educated and mentored and helped and coached, you'll know if there's something you read that isn't nice, you'll probably know yourself and be honest, actually, that wasn't good enough. I did miss mm -hmm. that kick. I did miss that tackle. Or, And if conversely, if someone says something nasty about you and it isn't true, you just know, no, no, I'll trust my own belief. And that comes from a good grounding and mentoring and support and coaching. But your honesty and your own performance is so vital. Yeah, I totally agree. Sorry, I just I totally agree with what you're saying there, Chris. But also as as the manager, as the the leader, mm -hmm. it's like I love to be that hands on. You know, like mm -hmm. as soon as the service is finished, mm -hmm. you know, or and and like we talked about earlier, that each one is individual. The one who really can take it on board straight after the service or the match mm -hmm. and say, listen, I don't agree with what happened tonight. You know, you really got to think mm -hmm. about that, or you know, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. And then there's the other one that you need to do the day after or something mm. because they're a different type of person. Yeah. Just taking me back to sitting into meetings, Tom, when uh, something it was Monday, always Monday, and it was always a slow motion button or the pause button for the coach. <laughs> it was the worst invention ever, but you're sitting in there. And it's exactly the same. You've got some guys who, before they even know what's coming, will put their hand up and say, you know, this is what I could have done better there. Yeah. I could have done that yeah. better there. And you've got other guys who'll be looking in the other direction. We used to talk a lot about uh, windows and mirrors, people. So when something doesn't go go well, uh, you want somebody to instantly look in the mirror, look out what they could do better. Uh, and then you've got others who look out the window for people to blame. Uh, yeah. and we used to talk about the fact we needed a room full of people who look in the mirror first. And yeah. Tom, see, you're closer to the, I suppose, the current crop of players at the moment than, than Alan. Are you in and around the change room on match day and training days? Is that still the same, the, the things that Tom and Alan and I speak about? Is that still quite pertinent for, for your observations? Yeah, definitely. I think um, just build, building responsibility for the players is absolutely huge. And there, there are obviously a huge amount of different personalities in the team, but we've got a brilliant gro uh, crop of young players that really take responsibility for their own actions. And they're getting that responsibility from the coaches as well, from, from what I've seen. So, yeah, we're a really positive environment overall. And is that, that would be the same for, you, for the diet and the nutrition that you... You know, you, you said earlier on, you have to be empowering these guys. Um, and they've got to build that level of trust. That when Chris and I first came into it, 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 it was there to a large degree. I think what's better, far better now than ever was, is the knowledge of the players. Yeah. Like, there was probably a, a small percentage of the guys back when we first started who had a decent knowledge of what they should and shouldn't be eating. Um, whereas now that seems to be more within the playing group, is it? Yeah, definitely. We, we've got some guys that are really into their nutrition. Um, you know, they could certainly give me a good run for their money with nutrition and knowledge. Uh, you know, the likes of a, a Lee Jones or a Pete Horn are really into their nutrition. Um, but yes, yeah, so they, they just take that responsibility on the whole for, for their nutrition and their, their good habits. Um, so yeah, they do a brilliant job in, in terms of looking after themselves at home. Because that, that's really important. If they have good habits at home, then this can really help to support their own performance lifestyle. And it helps to yeah. support that performance on the pitch. So it's really important that they, they do build good habits back at home with their food. Who's our aspiring chefs? Who, who could Tom maybe hire in the kitchen and put through an apprenticeship? That's a good <laughs> question. If, if you open up anything to do with a barbecue, then a, a John Barkley or a Xander Ferguson could... Uh, Oh, really? <laughs> certainly take a step through the door um, but yeah Pete Horn or even like uh, Chris Fazzaro through at Glasgow Warriors he's done some stuff for the Glasgow Warriors social media channels he absolutely loves his food we've talked about food there and clearly a desire and a passion for food Tom but one of your other passions in life is sport I know you're a, mm. you, you like all sports but Liverpool in particular uh, in football that is, that is your team now Oh yeah <laughs> Liverpool. See, it's easy to yeah no I'm a massive Liverpool fan I mean, <laughs> my grandfather was a just born along the road from Anfield. And when I was young, Liverpool had all these amazing Scots playing for them and they won everything. But um, yeah, we have four sons and they're all sport daft. So yeah, I love any sport. But if you were to push me, I, I think football would be my number one. But um, I just find it fascinating how, you know, the, the children are coming through and they've got such access to so many different sports and this and that. And I just really believe in the whole thing that each sport helps whatever sport it is, you know, and uh, we don't want to put pressure on them at a young age that they're going to be a rugby player or a football player or whatever. And, but it's just about, I just think it brings so much to a young person's life, 
having that team environment and looking after yourself and being good at sport and just gives you a confidence to go into later life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And did you manage to get along to, to, to BT Murrayfield for the Liverpool game last season? Oh yeah, for Napoli. Yeah, I was yeah. There. yeah that yeah. that was really good. Yeah, it was yeah. funny to see football being played at, uh, at Murrayfield, um, but it was good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was yeah. Good. and have you managed to get get along to the stadium for a rugby game? I, I know you're a bit you're really good pals with Hodgie, uh, yeah. Duncan Hodge, but have you been to any rugby games recently? Yeah, no, I've been. To, well, I haven't been. I didn't. I haven't been this season, unfortunately. And then uh, we obviously got cut off. I, th- I think I, Duncan had a few tickets for me for one of them, but. Um, you know, I love going to the rugby. It's brilliant. And I love the restaurants and rugby weekends, you know, like, you know, the atmosphere that it brings to the city, the vibe, you know, when the English are here or the French. And, you know, it's just brilliant. It's just fantastic. And, of course, Scranis Galley, you know, is going like a train. And, you know, I just, it's great. And all the old rugby boys, they, they yeah. come up for a good time, though. They, <laughs> you know, they, I've noticed that. It seems to be a, a good weekend for those rugby boys, yeah. And some, I, I read somewhere, um, is it true that Greg Wallace often comes up on rugby weekends? Does he spend some yeah. time with you? Yeah, Greg comes up. He's a massive rugby fan. Michel Rue Jr., big rugby fan. Uh, my old chef, Pierre Kaufman, he's from the southwest of France. Mm. Uh, actually, he knew uh, Vern because he was coaching in the southwest of France, I think. Yeah, is right, not? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, the, the love affair with especially the French as well. Actually, when I worked in Paris... I worked for a chef called Guy Savoie and he was rugby mad. And he used to have like these breakfast clubs before the match in Paris. And they would be the, they would have like these, these eggs with the tops cut off. And I was only like 19, 20 years old. And then they would have like scrambled eggs with caviar and truffle. And I was like, what? And they're all having their champagne. And I was like, it's crazy. So cook it with chefs and rugby has always been a, a real mm. love affair. Yeah. A lot of big eaters in rugby as well. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of big eaters. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, uh, one thing we're doing uh, at the moment is like like a lot of other organisations is, is showing old content and games from yesteryear. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wonder. I know you you'll be looking at putting content out and videos and recipes. Yeah. And in rugby, it's cyclical. So a lot of the things we see from games, maybe in the nineties or the eighties, it eventually comes around tactically, tacti- technically. Is it the same in cooking or is it just always evolving to something new or do you go and take inspiration from maybe old footage or old recipes yeah, no. from, 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 from yesterday? No, it's, it's always that circle, isn't it? Yeah. You know, like from, from someone like myself is very much um, in the traditional French gastronomy, you know, the classic mm. French cooking, but is, you know, diversified a, a bit. But, you know, there's so many new trends, but then they, as you say, they always seem to come around and mm. come back to suddenly the love of uh, classical food again, you know, but food is, uh, food is like sport. You can, you can, you can express yourself in any way that you really feel. And I think that's the wonderful thing about sport is that you can mm. express yourself. There's nothing great as seeing a sportsman, you know, just having that magical moment. And I guess it's the same for a chef, you know, when you create a dish or you do something really special and the customer comes and you can see the joy in their faces. It's, it's about that expression. Yeah, the, the fact, I, I completely agree with you and I'm taking myself back to my own kitchen, but there's something at the end of it. There's something uh, yeah. there's something tangible at the end of it that you can, you can celebrate. Now, for you, you celebrate that by passing it on to your customers. For me, it, it's, <laughs> you know, me. <laughs> and not only eating it on that night with the family, but, you know, making sure that there's, there's plenty of leftovers as well. But it's can, also about the journey as well. You absolutely. Know, like, what you guys do on the training field mm. and then seeing that followed all the way through to actually it coming together on mm. match day. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's the same, you know, it's about working with the suppliers. Then, you know, what they go through, the farmer, the fisherman, the, the, the vegetable growers, the dairy, you know, whatever, bringing that through the chain. Because as a chef, I really believe that, you know, the produce, the quality of the produce, and I'm not just talking about the expense, whether it could be a, a macro, you know, or a fine piece of beef, the quality of the produce is about 70%, 80% of what the finished product is. And if I can take that all the way through to the customer, just having that euphoria moment, that's, that's my job done. You know, like mm. I'm, I can go to bed happy that night. So, John, we'll often get asked about, uh, 
about games that stand out for us? Is there a dish uh-huh. that stands out for you? Is there something that you look back on or you continue maybe to prepare that is, it would be your absolute go-to, your favourite? Mm, well, wow, good question. Um, there's so many, but there's, the one that really stands out for me is, and I think there's like, there was little moments in the restaurant's history when we opened that made us stand out a little bit different from other restaurants. And the one thing that my, uh, my mentors had really got into me was the thing about seasonality. As soon as something is in season, then you want to have that on your menu to be the first. Okay? So in August, obviously, it's the festival in Edinburgh. But it's also what, what, on the 12th of August. It's what we call the glorious 12th, the first day of the grouse season. Mm-hmm. So obviously, the restaurant's super busy. So we finish lunch. I would then drive to the borders, to the Lammermuirs, get the grouse straight from the chute, still warm, still in feather, just being shot, race back to the kitchen, pluck all these grouse, feathers everywhere. It was like mayhem, get them all plucked, tied, and then people would start coming every year on the Glorious 12th because it was like a bucket list foodie thing to do. You know, so that for me, that's part of the journey is, that, you know, making these special dates extra special yeah tom you, you mentioned uh your local suppliers there just mm-hmm. how how important in general are these local supplies to you for not only your business but also personally as well and especially oh, at this time it's everything it's my life it's it's my it's my whole roots it's the the tree of what we do um and that's why this awful moment that we're all in just now it's like do, it's like dominoes because mm. we shut the restaurants we don't have the customers and then you, it's just dominoes onto the suppliers and everyone. So, you know, just trying to really help them, uh, you know, get the word out there. For example, the fishmongers, you can still order the fish. They will deliver the fish. The butchers, don't just go to the supermarket. That's what I'm just trying to say. Like, you know, go to the butchers, support these guys. And uh, because we will come through this, we'll come through better people, we'll come through stronger. And uh, we need to get back to doing what we do best, you know. There, there certainly are some challenges uh, around this time, but I also think there are some really great positives coming out of it. So like you say, supporting those local businesses mm. that are diversifying a little bit, being able to supply us with great produce, but also just getting in the kitchen more and just trying something new as well, yeah, I sure. think has been really fun. Forms a nice part of that home economics part of uh, homeschooling, yeah. I suppose, for you guys. Just so speaking with you guys, you know, Mossy Al and, and the two Toms, you, know, you wouldn't think of it on the outset, but, but when you do think about it in more detail, there is a correlation and a, and a similarity between the, the sacrifices that you guys all have to do to, to do your job. So whether you're a professional athlete, you know, you, you know, you're, you're giving up so much, you're missing a lot of times. And whether you work in hospitality, you're, you're, you're also working long hours and, and weekends. At this time of the year, though, what we're currently going through, I guess the positive is that you do have to get more time with your families. But to back to your earlier point, Tom, is a bit of an, an adjustment for you because you are so used to working those hours? Yeah, without a doubt, it's a massive adjustment. You know, it's like, uh, um, I've never experienced anything like it. You know, the only time we spend more than two days together is when we're on holiday, you know, because mm. we're always working. And, and when you own your own business, it never stops. It never stops because there's always a problem. There's always a problem. Whether it's the alarm going off or the, a leak or staff or whatever. So it never, ever stops. So, it's been really surreal. There's been so many great moments. There's been some pulling your hair out moments. Uh, my lawn is like, I'm going to have to get that 3G after this. Because it's <laughs> absolutely battered. Uh, four boys playing football non-stop. <laughs> I mean, it's just like. I can, I can uh, vouch for that. Um, Tom and I, a few years ago, um, we were to be awarded honor doctorates by Napier University. Uh, and Tom and I were, were to be, I think, awarded the same day. So uh-huh. I was dressed up, ready to go, and, and, and Tom had to just, I think there was a morning session and an evening session. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, the, 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 the staff at Napier, Edinburgh Napier said, listen, Tom's got to come in the morning, but he's not coming in the evening because he's working. He won't miss a shift, was, uh-huh. was, uh, yeah, no, was, 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 was my memory. Was that true? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, just, I'm just fanatical about it. I, I do yeah. whatever I have to do to be in the restaurant. And I don't know, like... I should really be better than that now. But, um, you know, like, even like I'll do service in the restaurant. I'll take the sleeper afterwards. So I'll go home, I'll shower. I'll take the sleeper to London, go in, do London, do all my stuff, and then fly back and get back for, like, the middle of lunch. Do you know, like, it's just that kind of, like, 
you're, you're only as good as your last meal that I don't know. It's, it's such it's a commitment. My DNA. Yeah. Uh, it's such a commitment. And, and Jamie's right, but I would pick you up on one point. That the word you use, we often hear sacrifice. When it's a passion and when it's a drive and it's what you want to achieve, be it in sport or, or, or in the kitchen or, or, or cooking, you, it doesn't feel like you're making sacrifices yeah. of the things you're missing. Yeah. It's just part of what you yeah. do because you do want to commit yourself and you do want to succeed. And I think that's, the, I think that's absolutely right, Chris. You know, it's, it's never felt, I've never felt like uh, I've not wanted to go to work. You know, mm. like, I, I, you know, I've never worked a day in my life if you think about it, and I mean, because I always love what I do. And I think if you look with your children, that's all you can hope for in life is that they find that something where they have that passion. To be in a job that you absolutely hate and every day you're like looking at the clock must be the worst, mm-hmm. the worst, you know. So we're, we're very lucky to have found these uh, professions. Are you going to go to Glasgow and set up a restaurant there so we finally get Michelin star back there's in that lot, great city? There's a lot of competition <laughs> in Glasgow, Jamie. There's an awful lot of competition, especially in the Mulgai way. Yeah. <laughs> in general, well, what is it about Glasgow I Just that it, it doesn't seem to be able to get a Michelin star? Um, I don't think it will be long, to be honest. Um, um, there's some great, incredible restaurants, especially in Finiston. The guys are doing a great job over there. Um, I, I don't really buy into that. I mean, the Michelin... The Michelin star, first and foremost, is good, but it's not the, it's not the be-all and end-all. It's mm. about creating these great, great establishments where, where food is cooked properly. And, uh, and Glasgow, in, in many ways, is far ahead of Edinburgh in a lot of the restaurants and the, you know, the atmosphere and, you know, that they create. Um, but will we go to Glasgow? Like, like Chris was asking, there's never been a plan. We just assess opportunities and we'll see. We've had lots of opportunities, but it's just not been right. And um, that road is a killer. <laughs> yeah, gents, unfortunately, we do have to, to leave it there. But I just want to say a massive thanks to Tom Coughlin, yeah. Scottish rugby nutritionist, and Tom Kitchen, um, superstar chef, for joining us here on the podcast. Thank you Tom, very much. Tom, in particular, best of luck in the future in, in the industry of, of the restaurants. Um, who knows what it's going to bring, but we wish you all the best. And, thanks, guys. You know, hopefully, yeah. get That's you back brilliant. on future. Good. Great to see you. And keep thanks, on. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Cheers. Al Mossy, great to have uh, Tom Kitchen, the uh, Michelin star chef, on it, alongside our own Tom Coughlin, who is the nutritionist at Scottish Rugby. Really, really interesting chat, but I think one of the main takeaways from me is is the, the correlation between the two. You know, I, I know I use the word sacrifice, Moss, but in, you explained quite rightly that it's not a sacrifice, but it's something you enjoy. But, you know, in, in the hospitality industry and in the rugby or sport, there is some correlation, isn't there? Uh, so many correlations. You work hard, as you say, you, you, you devote your time and effort to, to your best ability and you have to do it time and time and time again. It doesn't just culminate in one moment. You just have to, whether it's a, you know, a, an evening or, a, or a, a dish that a chef makes or whether it's us playing a game and then having to do it the next again. It is. It's um, so many correlations and as you say, how hard you have to work to get there, how much criticism you have to sometimes take, how much... Uh, help you need along the way, the people that support you, um, how much knowledge it constantly evolves as well. If you think about the game of rugby, it constantly evolves in terms of attack versus defence and strategy and trends. Food's the same, you know what I mean? And, and there'll be different players come into the game and raise the raise the level in one area of the field. There'll be a, a different chef comes into to that environment and raises the level. But um, loads of similarities and and you know from from a performance point of view, it's more crucial than it ever has been before to be eating properly, to be suitably fueled for, for what the players are asked to do, not just in a game, but every single day in training. So, um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of similarities and it's just so vital. Everything is tested to the nth degree now um, and the fuel you put in your body allows you to, to hit the, the top of those tests. And ultimately, um, as we, we touched on, the end product that you put out there is out there to be judged. Now, I didn't ever go into a game thinking I'm uh, going out to be to be judged or doing it for anything other than trying to win the game. But there's there's 90-95% of the hard work goes in before that. And then you go out there for us for the 80 minutes or for, for Tom delivering that plate, delivering that, that meal. Uh, I think that's a very interesting comparison as well. And, you know, he clearly he enjoys his sport. Um, he, he likes the analogies himself. And then to get Tom, Tom Coughlin or Tom kind of chucking in the, the information, the, the detail around the sports nutrition showed that even when you're looking at it from a sporting point of view in comparison to delivering as, as good a meal as he possibly can in Tom Kitchen's restaurants, 
yeah, the comparisons are definitely there. Now, one thing we didn't really touch on that probably has changed a little since our day was was supplements, Al. So we we yeah. would be whether it was you know protein bars or whether it was shakes or whether it was yeah kind of extra vitamins or fish oils. It seems to me now that that's still that's still an important part of it, but. It, the, the education around what the players eat, there's so much more nutrient and better stuff going in that there's maybe less need for for the, the supplements on top of that. It was a big shift, wasn't it? it, it, it and it was Richard Chesser, who was uh, just in before Tom, uh, his view was very much that if you can get the supplements, you can get the, the, the proteins and everything that you need from your food, it's a better way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, sometimes the supplements are easier and more practical as far as travel or uh, getting immediately after the, the training or the game. But like, I'm, I mean, I was a big fan of that. I love my food. So when they started saying, put the protein shaker to one side and, and take it through your food, uh, I think that's, that was a big change over our careers, definitely. Well, I, I, I couldn't really, uh, my appetite isn't huge uh, at all. And I got to a point where after weights, so we'd do weights in the morning, you'd have a protein bar, a protein shake, immediately after weights, get shower change, go for lunch. It got to the point where, a protein bar and a protein shake filled me up. I couldn't eat my lunch. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I was kind of unique in that sense. And, and you know, when I was playing, the, the nutritionist would just say, listen, it's more important for you to eat than to have this pint and a half of, of milk with, with the powder, protein powder, whatever in it. So I was kind of maybe ahead of my time just because my stomach was so small. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, it was so important to get the nutrients from your food. I couldn't stomach, you know, at times too. For me at the beginning, it was it was calorie intake. They were trying to get me to take as much as many calories as possible to like things like homemade ice cream, making your own ice cream and eating it. Uh, <laughs> just jelly, you so homemade ice cream. Like honestly, just anything you could get in. Uh, the saurine loaf, I reckon I was lucky. Oh, yeah, the saurine loaf. loaf. Like, well, I was eating that by the, by the kilogram. Um, mm. Jelly babies, well, jelly. I mean, tell you, jelly babies were the best thing you could eat as well. Mm. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced. I think things have probably changed slightly. Uh, the, the danger now, you, you seem all right, but the danger now is that we are used to putting in, for me, roughly about 5,000 calories a day when I was training and playing. If I continue to do that now, then you're not going to be like, you're not going to be like in the car to get to work. Uh, so you've got to change the diet a wee bit when you finish playing. What, what about you, Jamie, when, when you were playing uh, kind of community rugby? And you see these trends building down. Was there guys taking protein shakes and, and yeah. beetroot juices to, to try and aid performance? Yeah, there was definitely a transition period where um, you either had to commit and you had to go down this route of going to the gym, doing the weights and eating properly. And the other guys were just like, as I said before, like smashing the hula hoops at halftime <laughs> on, the side of the, <laughs> on the side of the pitch. And I was definitely in that group. Now, if you enjoyed our chat with Michelin star chef Tom Kitchen, you yourself can get involved as on scottishrugby.org from next Monday, we'll be releasing recipes from Tom for you to try at home. That sounds, that sounds like an internal competition for us guys. I think we've got to pick one of them, cook it, take a yeah. picture of it and then stick it out there to be judged. I'm, you, up for, you up for that? I will, as, I will happily... As long as, Tes- as long as Tesco can provide what we need for a Tom Kitchen recipe I'm laughing now gents before we go we are showing another live match this Friday night across our channels um, Mossy you were involved in this game it was Scotland mm-hmm. versus England from 2000 now I know you're going to talk in more detail to Jason White about this in our Crabby's Changing Room chat mm-hmm. later on today which will go out towards the end of the week but Mossy a quick overview of that game because it is an iconic one that kind of lives in a lot of Scottish rugby fans memories <sighs> yeah um, it's really strange it was a, it was a Six Nations it was my first Six Nations Championship. It came in after the first two games and played France at home and then Wales away. And the final game was uh, Sunday afternoon um, at, at Murrayfield. And it was absolutely freezing. And we hadn't won a game. England were, were on for the Grand Slam. It was all odds stacked against us. And it was just, you get in these games, you get this funny feeling before the game. And we were at a uh, Houston House Hotel out in uh, Broxburn, can near Livingston and Broxburn, um, and just getting on the bus, you just looked at each other, and it was just this kind of, I don't know, this feeling that this, this is going to be our day. Uh, as we got on the bus, the rain started, uh, which I wasn't a fan of. I'd much, much rather play it with a dry ball, but it just got wetter and wetter and wetter. Crowd played a massive part because they gave us a belief to, um, to keep going, to keep going. The 
I won't give too much away, but it was fairly abrasive and attritional. Um, there was one or two things that maybe would uh, wouldn't escape punishment now. The crowd fed of that. The players fed of that. Um, <laughs> James McLaren played uh, in, in the centre, and Big Jim was uh, was a great guy. Played at Glasgow, played in France, played in uh, Canada as well. Sterling, it was for Sterling. And he pulled something out in the change room that I'd never seen before in the change room. But he pulled out a, a boxer's gum shield that covered his top teeth and his bottom teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, this could be a sign of the times here. I've never seen it before. Um, so we went into that game having never, uh, hadn't won a game that, that Six Nations, managed the game, met the physicality, increased the physicality in England. The second half was almost a blur because it was so cold. I don't think backs touched the ball. We were probably in the wrong position half the time, but uh, sheer fight, desire and, and attitude won the, won the day and, and Hodgie knocked over all the points. As uh, as Jamie is touching on, we're speaking to Jace. My lasting memory uh, of Jace from that game was the ruck that he cleared for Hodgie to score the try. And Jace came in from about five, six metres away and hit uh, so hard that people were scuttled straight out of the back for Hodgie then to pick up and dot down. That and Andy Nicholl, after Nicholl cut a cup of blood, just trickling out his bottom lip. Uh, it was, it, honestly, it was so cold. It was, it was, it was one of, it, you're right, it was iconic for... for People were there. It was the first time in 10 years Scotland had beaten England. Um, uh, it was at home. It was Jason's first cap, actually. Um, uh, so it's definitely one to, to tune in. The worst thing is you, you, when you tune in, and well, if you're involved, you just see what he did wrong. I know it was only my fourth or fifth cap. I, I can still remember doing so much wrong. So, um, yeah, I might have to watch it through my fingers. Yeah, that game. Scotland versus England from 2000. The classic encounter will be across our social media channels, Facebook and YouTube from 7pm on Friday night. That's all from us this week on the official Scottish Rugby podcast together with the Royal Bank of Scotland. We'll be back next week with special guests Johnny Beattie and Greg Laidlaw. Don't forget the application window for the Royal Bank Rugby Force is now open. To be in with a chance to win practical and financial support to kickstart your club season, search Royal Bank Rugby Force. 